Hello, I'm Eric Meyer, and I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. And I am Brian Cardell. I am also a developer advocate at Agalia. And uh, today we have a we have a guest. Um, Val, please introduce. Hi, um, my name is Valerie Young, and I'm a, I work at Agalia also, actually. Yeah, so we we asked Val to come on because, um, well, so recently Ethan Marcotte published a book called "You Deserve a Tech Union." Uh, f- available from a book apart. And uh, on a recent episode of the Shop Talk show, he was a guest and he talked about it. It was a really good episode. Um, and so if you've actually never thought about things like tech unions before, certainly worth a, lis- a listen. Um, you know, because Brian and I, you know, in discussing this, uh, you know, came to the point of, you know, unions are generally pretty good. They seem fundamentally necessary under capitalism because there's this huge imbalance in power, especially when you have a bigger company, you know, unions and collective bargaining can help balance that out, but there are that it's not like a complete power balancing (laughs) because of the extreme power imbalances that can, that can occur. But there's also another way to go about it, um, which we were thinking about, you know, what about having a co-op like Agalia? Agalia is a co-op. It's worker owned. And we don't have shareholders, or if you prefer the shareholders are the workers at the company. Um, and there are other co-ops. Uh, and recently, uh, Val organized a talk and a panel on co-ops at the uh, Fosse conference. And uh, we have those online, which you could check out. But we wanted to have Val come on and sort of talk about like co-ops and, and you know, what what they make possible and uh, all that sort of thing. So Val, let's start out with, you know, for someone who's not familiar, like what is a co-op in this context? Yeah, well, actually co-op can mean a lot of different things. And I think it does mean a lot of different things to different people. It means different things in different places. It can mean a legal structure um, or it can mean uh, just something about the relationship of the 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 people contributing to the project. Um, So co-op at Egalia means something specific. It means cooperatively managed by the employees. Mm -hmm. So we all uh, organize the company as as we see fit together. There's no CEO or bosses or managers. Um, And like you said, in a way you could think of it as, as we're the only shareholders of the company. Sometimes co-op means that all of the employees are shareholders, but you still have a hierarchical structure. It's not cooperatively managed. It's just cooperatively owned. Right. And at Agalia, everything is is collective in a sense, right? Like if you may be, you may be as, not assigned, you may work on a team, like as part of the WebKit team or the compilers team, but there isn't a single person who's in charge of the team um, and says, this is what everyone else is doing. The team decides together, like hashes out what needs to be done and how are we going to do it? And sometimes we'll decide, you know, that other, you know, new things need to be done. Um, Stuff that isn't necessarily client work. It's just, Hey, if we do this as a team, then, you know, we will be able to do better work in the future. And it it's like that across the company, which I think is a little weird for some people because they expect, right, but so who's in charge? Like, who's the president? It's like, there's no president. Okay, but who's the CEO? No, there, there's no CEO. Well, like the founders. It's like, yes, we have people who co-founded the co-op, but they're not like special at the yeah, they're not at the top of the pyramid. They're they're some among many. They, I would say maybe they are well respected, sure. Um, but yeah. um, at Agali, even everybody is paid equally. Because I know, like a lot of the a lot of the things with the the union case are talking about trying to do some kind of collective bargaining, right? You know, you're bargaining with the company on behalf of all of the. Uh, employees or a, a big group of the employees at least to you know demonstrate to not to exercise some sort of collective power but that's not even 
a necessary thing at a galia because like we are the collective power and also um we don't have like per person salaries like we have a everybody receives the same salary um yeah but right yeah 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 the way that a galia is um cooperatively managed uh does eliminate the need for a tech union um and you could imagine though a company called a co-op that just has cooperative ownership might still need something like that um or maybe uh the ownership organization does by having being an owner you do have some say in some final decisions which acts in a way like a tech union some there's some check on power by the owners of the hierarchical decision making structure that already exists mm, okay so yeah that that so there, like you said there are co-ops that are hierarchical which to me is a little weird because this is the this is the only co-op agalia is the only co-op that i've ever been a member of um and so it it seems to me like how how do you have a hierarchical structure like how does that work but i'm yeah like you say it it that exists um did you have any people from companies like that on your panel at fossey actually um you know, so at at fossey the free software um Conservancy's new yearly conference, which happened for the first time this last year. Um, we had seven representatives from seven different cooperatives, tech co-ops specifically come um, to give a talk or participate on the panel um, over the course of a day long track about cooperatives. So just like, I guess there is a lot of overlap between free software and um, people who like co-ops um, just from reaching out through our networks to seeing who could come to this conference with a few months notice. Um, and I can't say that I'm an expert in every single one of those co-ops, although my impression is that there, for sure, I, I, there was a huge bias towards cooperative management, um, not just like a mm. ownership structure. Okay. Um, but I could maybe think of a few counter examples, <laughs> a slight yeah. counter examples. It it makes sense to me what you said that um, cooperatives are popular in the open source space, right? Because yeah, a lot of open source work is very collaborative. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. is that sort of the sense that you get as well? Is that well, this is what we, this is how we develop our code. Why would we not run our companies the same way? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I've I've been a cooperative enthusiast for a very long time, and my introduction to the whole idea was through free software when I was in college. Free software and hackerspaces um, was the first example that I saw of flat collaborative structures, um, and it it totally blew my mind, and I was all in, and um, here I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, <laughs> there are lots of non-tech cooperatives too, right? I mean, there's a, a long history and many different permutations of things. Like there, uh, uh, like in Vermont, I think the power company is a cooperative. Um, the telecom, I think, is cooperative. Um, there's lots of different... Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of co-ops um, and uh, there could always be more, <laughs> but I think, you know, kind of given our uh, culture and economic history, there's a lot of pressure um, out of familiarity or funding structures to make, uh, or property uh, structures or legal structures to make a regular hierarchical firm. Um, you know, even a nonprofit needs a CEO or the the structure of a nonprofit somewhat defines a hierarchical structure from the beginning. You'd have to like use loopholes to make a nonprofit, a cooperatively run mm. organization by its employees. Um, so there's like a lot of pressure and familiarity with hierarchical organizations um, to create hierarchical organizations, which is why I think that the free software case is very interesting because it was people's first example of what it was like to collaborate as equals among a group of people 
And, uh, and I think that a lot of people found that experience uh, transformative. So right. not just me. So we all know that working in a free software project is, is not always puppies and rainbows and picnics. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> working on uh, free software projects has a little bit of a reputation of being a little bit difficult. Does that same thing happen in co-ops? Yeah. Wow. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of known uh, difficulties with free software projects. And even over the course of the time that I've been involved in the free software community, which is just really a decade and a half since I was in college, I've seen a lot of growth and reflection. Again, like I said, I think that that free software projects are a lot of people's first opportunity to collaborate in such a non-hierarchical way. And I think you need some structures and norms and there's there's ways to do it right and there's ways to do it wrong. And since everyone's doing it for the first time, they had to like learn as they went. And I saw I saw this happening really. I saw the introduction of code of conducts that don't just talk about egregious cases, but also norms of communication that just make the whole process run more smoothly. I saw a uh, structure created where there it was a lack of structure and a lack of clarity about who should have what kind of access to what kind of thing. Um, so I saw a lot of um, growing up happen in that area. So how does how is that sort of thing replicated within co-ops in your experience? Yeah, so in cooperative projects, um, there are a lot of ways that you can fail. <laughs> and there are some, um, I think, really important things that you need to succeed when the cooperative project is a free software project or a business or a cooperative living situation. And uh, maybe it would be interesting to go over what I think from my experience are some failure Please. cases. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Um, so one one failure case, and I think this is the one that people first think of when they're like, oh, a co-op, how could that possibly work? Uh, is a cooperative project that has too little structure or no structure. Um, because we're only familiar with hierarchical structure, you're like, hey, make a co-op. And they'll be like, oh, that sounds confusing and messy. And like, who? how would anything get done? And who will make decisions? Um, and too little structure. Yeah, so too little structure, of course, you're not going to get anything done. And in fact, you have a um, serious um, potential for just replicating the existing and, and unequal power structures that exist in society, the people who are most privileged end up informally getting the most power when you don't have clear power structures or clear decision-making structures. Can you like um, illustrate that for us a little bit? Like give it uh, something a little bit concrete? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I feel like the best concrete illustration of this is an essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness by mm. Joe Friedman. Um, and it's about the woman's movement um, and in the 70s. And uh, sh they are uh, trying to create an, you know, anti-patriarchal um, organization of women and they throw out structure completely. And what she saw was that the people who naturally uh, have the most access to resources, uh, the tightest, the, the most free time, end up being the de facto leaders of the group. And it's even it's completely untransparent to anyone else why anything is happening the way that it's happening. Um, so it's a good essay to read, I think. <laughs> so that's failure option number one. Um, and failure option number two is too much structure, especially from the very beginning. Um, and you can never, a, a co-op, you know, you, you can, it's not something you can just dream of uh, in idly. Um, it's something that especially as you don't have familiar familiarity with, you need to figure out what works by doing. There's really no other option. So you can't really like formalize it completely before you begin it. You have to start it with an open mind. And also as the people coming and going will change, the people in your co-op will change. If you really want it to be cooperatively managed, it needs to be cooperative, cooperatively 
managed by all of the people in the room at that given moment. So it needs to change because the people will change. Even the needs of the people who started it will change. And uh, my <laughs> favorite example of too much structure is, uh, if you were about to ask that, Brian, is um, holacracy, which do you guys remember that mm, phase? Yep. Yep. <laughs> At Zappos and yeah, I, yeah. I do not <laughs> remember it. So can you refresh me? Yeah, sure, sure. Holacracy. Um, I remember being very excited about it when I heard it because I was already enthusiastic about co-ops and I heard that it was a radically flat model and and that a huge company was implementing it, Zappos. Um, but then the report started to come out of massive disappointment. People felt like a cog in the machine. They didn't feel empowered. There was too much process. Um, and reading, you know, the description, I actually hadn't read the book, but but I think that the author is like, this is like an operating system for a company. And, you know, people aren't oper people aren't computers. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a warning flag, I think, uh, to try to implement something like that. But there's that example. It's very rigid, very role based, but in a very rigid way. And also, I think one of its other failings is that it tried to make it so that people could work very autonomously, but that resulted in kind of less um, kind of collaboration and consensus building. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. So it sounds like it was an, you know, I mean, I haven't read the book either, but it sounds like, you know, everyone's their own boss, like, you know, do what's, do, do what's best for the, for the group. And then everybody yeah. went that, and did things and there was no real checking in with other people to say, well, actually, okay, it was, go ahead. It was kind of even worse than that because everyone cool. had very specific roles. Like you can only make decisions about these specific things. And it was like very mm -hmm. clearly outlined. Okay. So really was kind of making you like a little bit too much of a cog in a machine, like your predetermined roles, you're predetermined what you can make decisions about. And you can't make decisions about something that's in someone else's bucket. Right. So, I mean, we could, t we can talk about how we avoid that at Agalia. So let's, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right. Cause <laughs> what, yeah. well, while we certainly have challenges, every organization does, whether it's structured or hierarchical or not, like, I don't feel like that's a problem that we, definitely want us to go into a bunch about it but i want to say that uh val's talk uh is available online and it talks a lot about how egalia works and so i know people who listen to the show inherently must be curious so i would just like to point people to that uh as well that it is um really full of lots of details about how egalia works probably more than we'll get into here so yeah, right and and I do want to say that um, this discussion about uh, too much or too little structure is not a lot in that talk. The talk really talks about the structure that exists and a little bit about how it can be changed, or maybe not even that much about that. Um, so this is a little even more abstract than the, than the talk. So if you want an example of an amount of structure that works right now, then the talk is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, you know, I, I say in the talk, but I've only worked at Agalia for two years and it's been around for 22 now. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> which is to say that uh, I feel so appreciative of all of the people that have put in the long and slow work uh, to evolve Agalia to where it's at now. It was functional at these other times, but it had to change as we grew and as the people mm -hmm. um, changed. And so I'm so appreciative that Agalia has been responsive and that uh, my coworkers have uh, put thought to that at every, you know, new development. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, while we don't have a hierarchy, we do have like foundational documents. We have agreements that the company has arrived at, you know, as a, as a group to say, you know, this is how we, this is how the company covers travel, um, on the behalf of the company. And this is, you know, what the sick policy is. And this is what, you know, what this policy is and what all the various policies are, the things that you would expect of a company, right? It's like, you need to know that's all written down, but it wasn't written down by one person. It was, you know, over time, 
written down and, and modified. And we still proposals uh, will come up. In fact, I just voted on one recently. What I think is like a really interesting illustration of this, like in, in the abstract, this thing that we're talking about, about like, you know, sort of capitalism and unions and co-ops and like where they work and how they compare and contrast and everything. Like uh, there is it's a new law, basically like you're, time off increases with your seniority basically like so you you have a minimum that you're supposed to get in the country but then after you've been there for five years you get another day uh right and it and it it increases like until you have like maybe five more days and in this model any capitalist you know worldwide company that was faced with this would be like what is the minimum thing that we can do (laughs) Right? right like how do we make sure that our hundred employees in wherever it happens to be are the only ones that get this benefit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, I wanted to point out that um, this is an example of legal structures, which are um, encouraging something more hierarchical than what a cooperatively managed company might want. Mm -hmm. It mm-hmm. seems innocuous, like, oh, yeah, of course, you've been there five years, you should get one more vacation day. But if you're starting from a co-op's perspective where everyone gets actually a very generous large amount because and... we decided on it together, right, and the goal is equality, not um, to be able to rise up a ladder. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I think it's, this is just like a very clear example of how the legal frameworks work against a co-op and encourage against mm-hmm. a co-op. And this is one of the reasons why we see so few I think, but you know, in, in Agalia, we're able to say like, we, we can propose effectively how, how to deal with that situation. And because everybody gets a vote, like we don't have, uh, shareholders like this abstract shareholders that we're trying to generate a profit for, like that's us. Right. So, yeah. so we say, wait, that sounds like a really good quality of life improvement. Why shouldn't everybody get that? Right. right. Um, so yeah right. like can we just let's just do that yeah and you know and that's that's the thing about a, a about a collective a cooperative is that someone could have proposed okay well in that country they get that and we're going to keep everyone else the same and that could have been a proposal and then everyone votes on it i mean somebody could have proposed that we leave that country <laughs> also also <laughs> true you, you know we, and and you know we might have there might have been a proposal. Let's not ever hire someone from that country and we won't do work there. That's kind of against the Agalia norm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Agalia, uh, w- one thing that feels so special about it is that um, we decided to be an international company and we mm-hmm. just adopt the complexity of someone living in a different place. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It, it does lead me though like the the concept that someone could have proposed let's just not do anything in that country anymore does lead to something that that we that you know co-ops can do which is collectively decide to take or not take certain work um which is something i know has come up in the tech union context Mm -hmm. you know there's there have been people who have said well one of the advantages of a tech union is that like if uh, Google had a tech union, a strong tech union, then maybe the the union could say, we're not going to take any um, lethal defense contract, you know, lethal defense work contracts. And if the company takes one, then we go on strike. Right. Which is a, which is a, it could be stated as, look, any, anything like this will have us go on strike, right? Sort of proactively. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, a similar sort of thing can happen in a co-op, right? A, a, someone can say, yeah, I propose that we, you know, not work with Raytheon or we not work for uh, governments that are actively engaged in genocide or yeah. whatever, like, you know, or, or that we don't ever take work from companies whose logos are primarily yellow. <laughs> any of these could be proposed whether or not they get you know approved by the voting by by vote is a, a whole other thing but that sort of yeah. thing can can be done and it's right it's it there's that it's it's like a it's like a sort of a distorted reflection of 
w- one of those things that like tech unions are great for those. Like, mm-hmm. well, here's how we handle it in co-ops. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. And, and it's funny to use absurd examples, but um, Egalia does have a shared values document that you sign mm-hmm. on to. I mean, not, you don't actually sign a paper, but you like, you know, you're yeah. agreeing with when you, uh, start working at Egalia, um, right. and as you go through the process become, of becoming a partner, um, you kind of have to prove just by nature of your being that you are aligned with those values. And so we have a lot of shared values um, about uh, like free software um, and like other really kind of righteous, normal things, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> But we all know, we all know, we all know that no, that it would be silly to propose. Uh, uh, w- let's not work with a company whose logo is yellow. We we kind of have an idea of what the company's values are, and right. I just want to say that's something that's like a little uh, different way of being at a Galio. I don't feel like we feel blind to the rest of the company. We have like a strong intuition, um, and when we are making a proposal, we're not making a proposal by ourselves in a vacuum. Um, we're yeah. making it really collaboratively with that's other true. people. And that's yeah. that's like really, I think, a very different way of of thinking about decision making. Um, it's not like this hostile thing. I mean, of course, sometimes decisions are a little bit contentious. Yeah. But most of the time, it's just about finding the solution to the problem, not proposing two different solutions that then need to be battled out. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. That's another thing I guess I wasn't clear about is that proposals, I don't think I've ever seen someone just sort of pop out of the woodwork with a proposal, right? Like there was a discussion before there was Mm -hmm. a proposal to vote on and Mm -hmm. the discussion may have been lengthy and possibly contentious, right? People uh, being very clear about their positions and where they're coming from and other people saying, okay, I hear where you're coming from on that. Here's this other place I'm coming from, right? And it just... A lot of emails possibly. And then as long as the consensus is we should open this up for a wider vote, then uh, there's an actual poll that's opened. And there are thresholds for various kinds of polls um, that are that are defined. But, you know, if it, you have to get at least a majority and some of them are more than a majority. Um, and there are some kinds of uh, votes that are there has to be uh, above a threshold vote yes and below a threshold voting no, right? Um, which is a much lower threshold. Um, they're not always just simple majorities. Um, you know, so for hiring decisions might be a, a different set of thresholds than um, changing the vacation policy or whatever. Well, can we, maybe we can use a, a, another example of this, which is that um, effectively the way I like to describe this is like, we do contract work and that brings in dollars and yep. we have like an agreed upon budget and like how that works, like a, a certain amount of that will go into our savings in case there's you know, rough times or whatever. Um, an amount of savings, which was collectively agreed right, to. Exactly. And, um, but then the rest could just go right to us, right? Like just split uh-huh. it number of employees ways and that's how it works um but that's not entirely how it works uh egalia actually is you know one of the founding sponsors of open web docs for example we give money to all kinds of um different causes and things um Mm -hmm. we have a um corporate social responsibility commission that um you know, we collectively decide to give a, a nice bit of money to uh, different uh, causes like environmental causes and things like that. Um, and, you know, like those are those are things that we collectively decide to do and, and actually funding work that we just think is interesting that no one else is funding. Um, like, yeah, every time somebody proposes one of those, you know, it's, it is effectively asking all of your peers, I would like you to take home a little less than your paycheck because I think this is an important thing. Right. Can we all agree to do that? 
And honestly, it's very encouraging to me how much we managed to do like that. And, and positive yeah. in a way that I think that, um, you know, it's, it, it feels more positive than if, you know, Apple or Google, what, you know, whatever they do, it, it's done by a, in a completely different way. And it like impresses me less, even if it's several orders <laughs> of magnitude more money. <laughs> well, yeah, this is actually something that, um, I think, uh, leads us to why we are doing this podcast right now, um, is that uh, we were having a discussion in Agalia um, about our responsibility uh, towards the planet and climate change. Are we doing enough? I know we're just some random tech company, um, but what is what is a role that we should be playing or could be playing that we aren't playing? And one um, thing that was discussed in that discussion was that um, when a company is cooperatively managed, it tends, in our experience from Agalia, to make really altruistic decisions together um, because it's all out in the open where human humans, I think, are tendently over, overwhelmingly uh, interested in the happiness and success of not just themselves, but whoever they're surrounded by. Um, and we're an international company. We have people all over the world. We care about everyone at Galia. We care about everyone in the world, you know, with the impending climate crisis affecting pretty much everyone. And so we're, we're uh, looking for ways to help this problem that you can't really look for when you're in a hierarchical company, even if you wanted to. You have so few levers. You have so few visib visibilities into the structure and where, what, where money could be donated, how um, compromises could be made for the sake of climate change. Um, you have to leave it all to the people at the top who are regularly, uh, their hands are tied between the, uh, you know, things like short-term profit, uh, and perhaps what would be their own personal Share, altruistic. Yeah. Shareholder way. demand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which in our case, since we are the shareholders, <laughs> yeah. the, demand, the, the demand is coming from within, inside the building. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So essentially, I guess the, just to summarize, I think, uh, the more co-ops, um, the better off the planet is, the more empowered people are to act on their altruistic instincts. So, I mean, I guess that would lead to a question. Uh, what would you recommend to somebody or some buddies who are thinking about forming their own co-op? Like what, what, where would you tell them to start? Wow, hard question. <laughs> um, uh, okay. So there are a lot of resources for starting um, cooperatives uh, that available or that are available. Um, okay. It sort of depends on what kind of cooperative you want to start. Um, but a, like I said, the legal stru structures are somewhat at odds with the goals of a cooperative uh, corporation. Um, but but uh, if you're starting one just with a group of friends, you can easily find available on, inf information available online, lawyers who specialize in this, bylaws that are draft bylaws. There's the Sustainable Economies Law Center in the Bay Area that has a lot of resources about this specifically. Um, and also, I would say, uh, you know, find other co-ops also and learn how they're doing it. Because like I said, we've had very little experience and we can only uh, in our lives overall. So you really got to um, learn by talking to people. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I think uh, one there, there in my in my talk, I talk about the four essential ingredients to a successful cooperative. Um, there are things like equality, trust, shared goals and values, and mutual respect and appreciation. But if you're starting a company, you need to make sure that from the very beginning, you, with your comrades, have shared goals <laughs> for the company. Mm -hmm. um, and you need, you know, you can't solve every problem at once. Um, a company can't solve every problem in your life. You got to like figure out what is the, how does this company fit into our lives and what are the goals of this company? Um, and 
if you uh yeah i think that's good that's good maybe it struck me as interesting that you would find information on co-ops at a place that wasn't called like the cooperative law center or the, it's the sustainable economies law center right yes um that's true the sustainable economies law center is uh focused a lot on various social justice issues. They're also actually cooperatively managed, even though they're a yeah. nonprofit. There we um, go. And um, I think that their interests are trying to figure out how to create a more equal world, given the legal structures that we have. Um, and it's kind of a little bit streaming up, uh, swimming upstream in some cases, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's for, you know, it, just like we're talking about. I mean, capitalism is in a very sustainable economy in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how, how is it that we create more sustainable economies? You're right, you know, like the, the name is the same as as um, the mission of uh, Egalia, which is that a co-op <laughs> is a more sustainable uh, system for a better world. Right. That's... That's a, one of the founding principles, although I don't know if it's been written down in exactly those words. Um, I would absolutely take that as sort of a, a, a guiding principle that by working together, we work better than, you know, working in a hierarchical structure or working on our own, right? Yeah, um, totally. Because you can absolutely, you know, if you're, if you're uh, running into a problem, uh, you can reach out to other members of the collective and be like, hey, can, can anyone help me with this? Or mm -hmm. does anyone have experience here or any pointers or anything like that? And you have a whole bunch of people to draw on um, the same way that you that you hypothetically do, at least in, in open source, right? Where you say someone opens an issue that says this is a problem and somebody can come in and, and address it and solve it. Um, yeah, so is it... You, you said that there was a whole day track at the, uh, at Fossey, the, at the conference. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is, is that going to be, do you know, is that going to be a thing every year or was this special for this year? Well, um, even organizing a track, it turns out is a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> um, sure is. And I, and I personally don't think that I will organize it next year. However, um, the co-ops that attended were very enthusiastic and a lot of people who attended were very happy about it and some of the conference organizers themselves. And um, someone might pick up the torch, uh, okay. specifically a Garrick uh, co-op that um, attended. They said that they would like to, so okay. hopefully, hopefully they do. Let me bring it back around to tech unions. So one of the things about unions is that they tend to become hierarchical. <laughs> And actually, it seems like a lot of the past abuses that unions, uh, you know, perpetrated were rooted in a hierarchy. So, you know, maybe a, a, a thing that that tech unions should think very seriously about is being cooperative unions rather than being hierarchical unions. Yeah, yeah. So there is a term for this in unions. Um, it's the rank and file strategy. It's to uh, have more democracy in the union itself. Uh, so more democratic control of the union by the members of the union. And the phrase for that is rank and file unions. Okay. As opposed to these like stodgy old hierarchical unions that I think are kind of unfortunately, well, definitely like, you know, unions have been dragged in the dirt because power, some powers would um, benefit from them not existing. Um, That's but, true. But there is also, unfortunately, been a lot of corruption and a lot of uh, opportunities to drag unions in the dirt yeah. when the organization is very hierarchical, which allows for corruption. How, I, like, I wonder if I can ask all three of us, I'll share my own, but if, if I could ask the two of you, like, I had a career in corporate America, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't work for co-ops before that. Um, and when I was coming to Egalia, it was like, I have no idea what to expect. Like, I was honestly a little afraid. Um, like, it sounds incredibly overwhelming. I can't imagine, like, how it could work because 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because like I, yeah. uh, the only time that I see anything at uh, that was like trying to make group decisions felt like they didn't go very well a lot of times. And I was like, I'm, I just can't even imagine like how much, how, like how would you even make that work? But I knew some people who worked here and, you know, they, they tried to like allay my fears a little bit. And I knew that they seemed like pretty well-rounded people and not, you know, like people I trust. So I came here and it was like really intimidating and like, it took a while for me, honestly, um, to sort of figure it out. And like, we have done a few things to try to make some of that easier, um, I think part of it for me was also because I came in in a kind of a role that didn't exist before and we didn't know how that was going to work. Hopefully Eric's was a little bit easier, but yeah, like what was that like? I mean, there were, there are still things to this day where like, I'm not sure I know the right way to, to do that, you know? Uh, and I have to go ask somebody. Um, but yeah, what can you, can you talk anything about that? Like, do you you feel like you're like very comfortable in it now. And like, what were your impressions? I want to say though, that for me, I can't imagine not being in a galley now. Like I would not want to be somewhere else. Um, I really, I'm all in on it. Like it's, I like it a lot. Yeah. I, I, I want to, yeah, that's a great question. And I enjoyed hearing your answer actually. And Erica, I'd like to hear yours too. Mm, I mean, it was a little scary <laughs> coming in, not, not scary in the, uh, I'm mean, being terrified just in the, like, what do I do? Right. <laughs> like it was very uncertain. Um, you know, who do I, who do, who do I talk to, to find out what I need to do? Um, and you know, <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, no, I, I'm just, I, I was curious because I have had some experience in co-ops in the past. Um, I mean, both of you have had experience in standards and free software projects and mm. um, and alternative organizations that aren't just a hierarchical firm. So even though, Brian, you say you came from corporate America, I think you still actually had some intuition for, you know, uh, what things are like in a consensus group like CSS um, in the W3C. Um, that, and... that is why I thought you couldn't run a company. <laughs> 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 oh, real. Too real. All right. <laughs> you know what? Actually, you know what I want to kind of throw back at you? Just now, I'm idly curious. Yeah. Um, is that now that you've been at a successful working flat organization, do you feel like you have insights for the CSS working group, like ways that it could change structurally to be a more effective flat organization? Uh, or do you I think that the, I think standards have a similar film mode to the one that you described. Um, and I don't know that I think that that's necessarily a failure mode as much as it is like, the limited success that we're constantly learning from and trying to do better at. So what I mean here is like standards are set by the people who show up and do the work and it's a lot of work mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. Generally speaking, that is overwhelmingly bent toward people who are paid to do that job. And yeah. uh, some organizations pay an awfully lot to an awfully lot of people to do that work and thus have really a lot of influence. Um, mm. And I don't say that like it's a, like it's a negative. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I'm thankful that somebody is paying because somebody has got to pay. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the system in which we've set up is like kind of fundamentally flawed in that way. Um, that is really fundamentally unequal. I would yeah. say. Yeah, I, this is, I think this is a, this is a strong point of contrast between a co-op like Agalia and the standards body, like any working group really, but Brian and I know the CSS working group best. So it's a feature of the landscape that 
you know, if big tech co can pay to send five people to a working group or a bunch of working groups, and that's literally all they do, right? They do that work. That's what they do for big tech co. Then they will have an outsized influence on what the working group does, Mm -hmm. um, what they take up, what they don't take up, what they advance, what languishes, those sorts of things. And, you know, yes, Agalia does have several working group representatives, but so far as I'm aware, (laughs) and uh, Brian and I would probably be the ones who, who would be like this, that is not our sole job. Like we have many things other to do being on working groups is just one of those things. And it's, it's not even necessarily the biggest thing that we do. Um, it does not take up like no one working group takes up the majority of my time or Brian's time. Yeah, definitely. Not. You know, standards work certainly could, but you know, Brian's on how many working groups are you on now? One of which you're sort you're yeah. co-chairing or well, Bal, Bal is right. also a co-chair of the ARIA working group. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I'm sorry, Val. But I love the ARIA working group. We're very nice. Right. <laughs> yeah. But so, surely you see the, the, this in there as well, right? Like, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. and yes, um, and at the end of the day, it comes down to who is going to do the implementation work, and somebody yes. has to fund that work. Um, so, yes. yep. so like to your question about like, do I have things that I think are, are lessons, takeaways? Yes, but I don't think that they're for the CSS working group, and I don't think that the CSS working group itself is a bad working group. Like it is actually quite, quite a functional working group. Um, I think the, the bigger problem is like the whole ecosystem around it. And, um, what I would like to see, uh, I, this is not a secret. I've said this a number of times, but, um, think that it would be really critical for something like the ability for companies entering a working group, to like sort of pool money, like not all of the money, but like to pool money. Uh, and then to say, like we do at at Galia at the, at every year we have a budget that we propose and approve and we just like automatically leave, uh, you know, a percentage of people slots open. Um, that is for, us to invest should we choose to invest in things so people will propose things wow like why couldn't companies pool money and then collectively decide how to use that that fixed budget right and i think that that would solve two like two entirely different kinds of problems I know for certain groups, like in CSS Working Group, for example, the print community exists and, you know, they, and publishing also, which I guess is print, but also eBooks and things, right? And they constantly feel like they've been ignored for, you know, a decade or whatever, because it's not anybody's priority. And they feel very specifically like that's, you know, Google and Apple ignoring them or something, you know? Uh, not that it's really hard to find the priority for that. And if the, mm-hmm. if the working group kind of collectively was responsible for that, then I feel like they would feel again, more collective and make different decisions basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I think that's a great idea. I'll support it. Yeah. yeah. Unleash, unleash the goodwill of the many, um, the collaborative goodwill of the many. Yeah. So this, like, a little bit, the nature of why we came up with the open prioritization experiment that we had. Um, We're Mm -hmm. kind of hoping to seed that. We thought, well, we pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to belong to the standards organization, but we could also pay tens of thousands of dollars to just get it done, too, because sometimes it's just... Sometimes just we need somebody to do the work, not we don't necessarily need more people to sit and talk about it, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. true. But I think we've wandered into the weeds. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I like that this um I I I feel like the questions involved in and the solutions provided by cooperative ownership and cooperative um organizational mo- model models 
and democratic control are applicable to so many spheres of our life. Um, and so I kind of like that, uh, Brian, you took it to the W3C in this, this way. It's like the democratic control over uh, the money that's donated to the W3C, at least in this small way towards um, implementing some of the specifications that we really care about and some of which are more altruistic than they are um, business motivated. Um, and uh, I think that was, this is a great, great application. Yeah. And I think that's probably a good place to, uh, to wrap it up. Valerie, thank you so much for joining us and talking about co-ops. It's been, oh. a, been a great discussion. Great. I love talking about co-ops. So I really enjoyed it. So like just to wrap up, I want to say uh, you, you could check out Ethan's book. You deserve a tech union. Uh, you could check out his shop talk show. And uh, I would like to throw in, maybe you also deserve a tech co-op. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll throw in, uh, remember to check out uh, Val's talk um, about Agalia uh, from the inside and also the uh, panel with uh, seven co-ops. Uh, those are on Agalia's YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash Agalia, if I remember correctly. And uh, they're relatively recent, so you should be yeah, should be relatively easy to find. But I think if you search our channel for co-op, you'll find them pretty easily. So, Val, thanks again. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.